All right, I think while that is happening, maybe let me get started because it's already 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time here. And uh, hello, everyone. I thank you for joining for this webinar. Uh, my name is Harish Gandhi. I work for CIMIT as an Associate Program Director and Breeding Lead for Dryland Crops. These are the new crops for which CIMIT has started the program that includes sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet, chickpea, pigeon pea, and, and groundnut. Uh, this webinar is a third in our series of webinars on International Year of Millet. The previous webinar uh, we had was around unleashing the potential of millets, uh, which was the first webinar, and the recording of that is available on YouTube, and we'll put it on the chat as well. In the second webinar we had uh, was on the processing of the millets. Uh, now, today's webinar, you know, we have a line of speaker, uh, and uh, so first speaker we have uh, is Dr. Dayakar Rao, followed by Dr. Peter Rustart, and Dr. Paul Mwendi, and Dr. Anind Abandupadhyay. So these are the speakers we have today. The title for today's webinar is Millet Processing and Progress on Understanding Pearl Millet Rancidity. And uh, so who are joining us from different parts of the world, just like to guide you on various interpretation which are available. So if you would like to uh, avail this webinar in different language, click on the interpretation button, uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, the basically, uh, it will look like a globe icon. And if you click on it, you will see a various language options. To choose the language option you would you would prefer, we have it in English, French, Spanish, and, and Hindi. Okay, so with that, let me first try uh, introducing the first speaker uh, today. Uh, today's first speaker is Dr. B. Dakar Rao. Uh, Dr. Dakar Rao is a seasoned agriculture researcher with uh, over three decades of experience in the processing value addition and marketing and, and, and policy and entrepreneurship development of millets in India. Uh, he's credited with piloting various successful millet value chain ecosystem. And those has been replicated all over India in various states, such as Karnataka, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, and also, you know, Madhya Pradesh and, and Uttarakhand. Uh, Dr. Dayakar Rao, he's a CEO of NutriHub, uh, which is a technology business incubator which is part of an Indian uh, Council of Agriculture Research Institute called, called IIMR. IIMR is Indian Institute of Military Research. And through NutriHub, uh, Dr. Dakar Rao has made a significant contributions in developing and strengthening millet processing. And we'll hear a lot about that today. And, and that has created a huge value addition for millions uh, of farmers because there is a huge. There was a huge demand issue for millets in 2007. Uh, Dr. Dakar has developed over 60 technologies and over 50 value-added products, and created okay. over 200 recipes with his team. Um, you know, uh, at at NutriHub, he has also mentored several hundred startups and, and incubated you know 200 of them, and which the startups through this incubation have received. Uh, you know, a couple million dollars already from government of India in the grant in aid. Uh, Dr. Dakar Rao has received numerous awards, uh, including, you know, Innovative Scientist Award, which is a national award given under Millet uh, Award in 2018 and 2023. And also recently he received award, a leader with a strategic vision uh, under Agribusiness Summit. Uh, so with that, with, with that very brief introduction, uh, I would request Dr. Dakar Rao to start his presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Harish. <clears throat> so, and uh, the opportunity that is given to me, uh, especially the organizers from CIMET, uh, the entire team, uh, the topic that is given to me under this millet processing and understanding the pearl millet rancidity, mainstreaming millets through diversified millet processing and enhanced shelf life. I think, uh, uh, the, enough of uh, introduction is given about me, so I'll just move out uh, forward and uh, say I don't need to give more, too much of introduction because we all are familiar with that. But for saying that uh, resistant millets are grown in 131 countries, of which sorghum and pearl millet, which occupies about 90% of the global production. And uh, 
we know that it is india is the largest producer several minutes that are there and uh, india also accounts 85% of the asia's uh, production also now uh, the, if you want to re- historically know what's happening here about the millets uh, in fact uh, the story of uh, 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 decline in millet production and consumption which is very pronounced over past seven decades uh, now you see that uh, it is uh, being stabilized uh, but nevertheless the extent of the decline in area under different sorghum is about 70% uh, primarily occupied by maize cotton sorghum in some of the uh, deccan plateau uh, and then pearl millet in the northern part especially the rajasthan and the gujarat side which again maize mung bean and cotton are being these are bread trial and cereals as you know that finger millet again up to 53% uh, it is in the southern part and also northern part uh, where maize and cotton maize has been a common crop across this uh, small millets uh, about six small millets that are grown especially in madhya pradesh chatisgarh and other places we see that uh, they were eroded primarily because of soybean maize and cotton there were several reasons uh, of course uh, the policy green revolution that has come and uh, we were looking for the quality uh, quantity fulfillment of our uh, food needs but then uh, we see today that we have rediscovered saying that uh, nutrition security is far from uh, uh, achieved so uh, food to nutrition so we are moving towards that uh, of course there are other things but one of the major thing is about uh, as we are talking about the processing lack of convenience in consumption especially the type of the patterns of consumption that are there in india speaks just like a tortilla type where mexico that is the primary form of consumption so to make it is very difficult and uh, because lack of gluten and so we are going to talk about it in addition to the other input as well as output factor uh, output incentive factors uh, that has led to the erosion of this end. now we are talking uh, once again millets and uh, 2023's international year of millets but it started with the problem of demand i think that is what uh, we have envisaged at uh, indian institute of millet research and we started working on how to build this millet value chain in india and to bring into the fore how the it can make a difference in the plates of the consumers while it is addressing the farmers demand for the cultivation also so imr indian institute of millet research led consortium intervened and brought out about the various stakeholders putting the various components as you see here some of those things which we have put the farmers consumers how they are now being connected but uh, uh, the other important aspects is the awareness creation through promotional activities uh, r&d and quality control being the backbone of this uh, with the food processing and the machinery development which was lacking in that of course while we built all these things uh, we brought about the entrepreneurship development now uh, millet as a model crop to establish a value chain there were about under world bank project that uh, we have uh, attempted about 51 commodities of which uh, the millet model is stands to be very tall and uh, now this model is to be replicated to other millets also so uh, the basic components as are outlined here uh, perhaps uh, the policy is missing but then uh, the six major components in addition to the policy are backward integration where on farm production because uh, creating a commercial color to that because it is grown by the farmers for their own consumption now it is moved on with the help of uh, uh, itc uh, a multinational indian multinational with which we were trying to work uh, as how the technology backstopping can be given to the farmers and then bring in a, a commercial color to that uh, also uh, providing a, a very because being a core institute of uh, on the crop improvement we thought that uh, by identifying the end product specific cultivars for various processed products so that that was also identified but uh, the major uh, intervention that has come is about the diversification of processing technology with the state agriculture university we removed the in- inconvenience that were existing primarily because of lack of gluten and brought up brought about uh, ready to eat and ready to cook uh, such a millet based value added product technologies and standardize them and uh, worked on the shelf life of those uh, and uh, Uh, of course uh, taking on to various other parameters with regard to the uh, nutrition 
nutritional evaluation and certification was very, very vital for us because the crucial part of why millet should be brought again, the nutritional evaluation and certification, the wisdom prevailed us so that we went ahead with the clinical trials and brought about the evidences for various claims that which we are bringing up, apart from making some sort of a simple organoleptic evaluation of these recipes that are brought out. Uh, and they were brought in, of course, on par with the rice and wheat, uh, the products. Uh, <clears throat> then after that, uh, we have registered a brand called Eat Right because uh, that was the first brand that one has to pilot and show that this uh, domesticated crop uh, can be commercialized. So the pilot commercialization of sorghum products in a city where uh, from the southern India, we did some piloting and uh, that was a landmark decision to launch its uh, Indian Institute of Millet Research brand which is called Eat Right. Then we went ahead with the promotion and popularization simultaneously, hitting the various parts, including various uh, innovative ways of uh, taking the various platforms like marathon, cyclothon, like exhibitions and everything, electronic and print media to take this uh, and create awareness on the nutritional and health benefits of the millets. While doing all these things, I think that was fine, That, but there was a great interest that generated among the entrepreneurs, seeing the consumer <clears throat> response, they have come forward, they wanted to really just get to invest money in this and then a lot of startups came, uh, started and uh, we were providing not only entrepreneurship development, but providing the technology licensing so that they may take this thing. These are unheard for them as far as the millets are concerned. Looking into millet pasta, vermicelli and all are so in addition to that, we were also trying to build up the policy aspects also and uh, sensitize the governments uh, so that the millets can be brought back. So, but uh, the real, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, historical moment happened when we started realizing that there is a need for us to commercialize them. So uh, not only just after piloting, but we have established NutriHub, a technology business incubator supported by Department of Science and Technology Government of India has become a commercial facade of uh, Indian Institute of Millet Research, wherein we started giving wings to the millet entrepreneurs, which was very vital. And it also coincided subsequently with the COVID uh, presence. And uh, the, that has, uh, in fact, uh, when all other markets were down, we saw there is an upsurge in uh, millet entrepreneurship where uh, the immune nutrients that are present in millets were very well appreciated by the consumers across all in our India. So now we have our two uh, flagship events, uh, and grain uh, that is a seed support funding where we provide for, for those who are already into the millet business for one year, then we give all the support up to 25 lakhs Indian rupees. Uh, while uh, those who are aspiring entrepreneurs, we provide up to 5 lakh rupees uh, so that uh, this pre-stage entrepreneurship also we were trying to encourage. Now, these are all continual programs that are running even now. We are going for the eighth. Now, so far, we have supported about 100 entrepreneurs with more than 11 crores of money. But the uh, most important thing is that we have handholded more than 200 uh, in, uh, under NutriHub. While we see the growth of this entrepreneurship uh, happened that for more than 600 entrepreneurs have come up in past six years, directly or indirectly, Nutri has, has become a backbone in providing whether they are incubated with us or not. But most of them, 34% of them are women. And we see that uh, their resilience is quite good. And in terms of employment, in terms of investment, in terms of the social impact, I think we have a very good uh, track record reaching um, more than 5 million farmers that are linked and 15 states out of the 25 states that are present in the country that we made our thing. Now we are expanding further. There are several licenses we have given, but uh, 77 technologies developed from zero technologies. There was no technology. The value-added products, 77 from various millet crops and uh, 34 value-added products that we are uh, commercializing under our own e -tried brand. But now our concentration is primarily on that and uh, take things forward uh, to make more end of the the type of the products that which we brought uh, are really just uh, commendable in terms of because of the lack of gluten what happens is that primarily you will not be able to um, make uh, because the gelatinization doesn't takes place that uh, uh, you know that uh, 
binding is a problem so we instead of manipulating protein a disruption is made because of through the uh, understanding of the traditional technologies where hydrothermal treatments are emphasized to bring in some sort of a star gelatinization and the processing is made possible now we led the uh, breakfast cereals and beverages staple foods uh, in different segmentation that which we made and we saw that how the uh, entrepreneurs across have taken the various technologies now even the, though we provide a grant in aid facilitated under rkvy there is a program of the government of india but we see some of our own startups getting the venture capitalist other than the uh, the government funding so that uh, they should be able to support so i think this is this speaks about the commercialization and, and the strength that it uh, the sector is assuming uh, and of course uh, as we see that uh, where the demand was a major problem but the end of the year with the type of the awareness that is created we saw that there is any demand is short by 40% or and now we are again researching and really looking into the ways and means how the production can productivity can be enhanced and all the same now facilitating millet promotion through multi stakeholder linkages was very very vital for us we see that hot extrusion and nutri bar the big companies some of them are like pepsico tata consumer products which are a big names nestle india britannia uh, unilever and other companies like buller and others are also on our board so we are trying to see how these industries can really just link up with uh, our farmers and bring in value to the farmers at the backward and in the forward the startups can also be linked so that the share of that uh, consumer rupee can be uh, equitably uh, shared by by all the stakeholders so though uh, there are several state millet missions that which we are working with the government sir and uh, providing all that strength because this has become a very important for us to really just pronounce and go from stay one stage to other and of course the startup incubation is one of the key uh, activity of the nutri hub and then we there were several challenges in millet value chain which we have now we see that uh, which were addressed uh, but then as the millet challenge it is being scaled up across pan india we find that there are challenges in terms of uh, a low productivity of the small millets and uh, when there is an intensive uh, cultivation intensive cultivation pests and diseases there it could come up uh, then declining cultivation area this is another challenge so because in the short term that the producers are not able to get uh, a due share in the consumer rupee and then this way we can move forward but the uh, primary processing challenges uh, primarily i would like to Uh, outline that shelf life of the processed grains which is very very important which is part of that in addition to regulations uh, the grades and standards establishment with regard to secondary processing challenges uh, gluten free limitations occur so that we could go only to sometimes partial replacement of millets uh, with that of the entire currently used uh, raw material like wheat and rice so again uh, in the shelf life is better in case of secondary process challenge rather than the primary processing and uh, of course uh, we have the machinery aspects that which we are mechanization of the ma- machinery which is in due course and we are very strong in that i think as uh, india would take and uh, really provide that there is no need for us to really limit and of course marketing and policy will take place and then this overcoming the challenge in the millet processing for enhanced shelf life shelf life that's what we see some of the pictures shows that the mechanization where it went and the type of uh, products that are being brought out uh, including the analog rice uh, and the diversification that is that which we would like to take it to the other thing now imr has bro- broken the inconvenience through innovation product specific cultivars we brought out nutrition profiling we made for 2250 cultivars and uh, these crops are screened for some time and tackling the absence of the gluten as i have already said and diversified technologies so the range of technologies from semolina to rice analogs uh, you can see how these products are all made out of millets there are some constraint in baking but we are able to overcome there also with a multi gravity now coming back to rancidity in millets it is just primarily rampant in uh, you see in pearl millet uh, challenges in processing so it causes fats and oils to deteriorate uh, and develop an unpleasant odor that's what uh, various factors Dr. Rao, 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah you, you have five. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank uh, you. High high fat content, enzymatic re reactions, moisture content, and microbial growth and lipase activity. After tackling the lipase activity, the lipoxinase is another thing. But uh, identifying the rancid product of fodders and of flavors and bitterness. This presence of high fats in the germs of a germ of seeds along with extremely active lipase that is, is resulting in that. So uh, rancidity could be three types, but out of which hydrolytic uh, oxidative rancidity we need to cut off. Now, we see that there are several current technologies for shelf life and uh, which we are trying to bring about shelf life and improvement up to two months maximum. So there is a great need. If it, as a grain, there is no problem. But once you open that, uh, process it and make it, then it opens for the lipase activity. And this is what we see that uh, there have been several pre and post process method conceived and uh, which will enhance the shelf life. We are just trying to get into the low hanging fruits by going for not just application of preservatives like enzymes, antioxidants, and each technique will be evaluated based on the effectiveness. And some work is also happening with regard to the packaging system. But also there is a, a type of the processing that also matters now. For example, extrusion can take you uh, to six months of this uh, uh, shelf life. I think that that's what I would like to say. So the lessons learned from successful interventions, uh, especially in, uh, with regard to various things. But uh, finally, I would like to cover uh, the challenges in mainstreaming the millets and way forward. Now, challenges uh, as seed quality material, strengthening the seed chain with the seed hubs, Declining area, we were trying to get into the increasing productivity and competing intercropping and better end out and inclusion of millets in the government program and equilibrium for supply and demand and low aspirational value of millets limit them from the household. Manage. So we are trying to balance supply and demand, which we're trying to study and promoting millet as an aspirational food with the government taking up and down. This. Now with regard to consumption also, a lot of misconceptions have been uh, we are do, doing through the media and branding, branding through social media from poor man's crop to now it has become a rich man's but we would like to mainstream and creating an awareness because uh, they can even all others people uh, we are trying to market segment and provide different types of products for different uh, private sector engagement in millet value chain has been a very great strength uh, now this way NutriHub uh, is working and uh, not only the uh, products, but also upcoming technology so that we may put it on par with the uh, rice and wheat and provide consumer various options uh, so that uh, I think not only to make them available pan India, but also transfer these technologies to the other countries also. Now we know that uh, uh, Indian Institute of Millet Research is now identified as a global center of excellence and with the NutriHub as its sound, the model of entrepreneurship development and the piloting uh, and the way we are moving forward across, uh, so I think that is going to, especially under South-South Triangular Cooperation for mainstreaming millets in the world. So ongoing partnership uh, in the India and Nigeria, China and Ethiopia, Mexico and Peru. So we would like to share the knowledge and best practices, joint research development, capacity building. These are some of the things apart from uh, other things that come on our way. I think with this, uh, I kept my time and uh, maybe one minute before, uh, I would like to thank you very much. The issues are there, but I would like to conclude saying that uh, this is like today's situation is like a perfect storm. So in a perfect storm, you know, there are problems, but also there are solutions to it. I think Millard promotion has that leverage, which we, we all need to take it and make it a global product. And India would like to serve as a, uh, global hub of uh, millets. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dayakarov. That's a very, very nice and impressive presentation of all the work which has happened at NutriHub and, and the Global Center of Excellence at IMR. And I, I just like to remind all the participants, if you have any question, please use the Q&A section of, of the uh, Zoom and post your question. Uh, and Dr. Rao, there is already one question, and you please, if you can, don't mind, try to answer it online, but we will uh, come to it as well uh, live. Now we'll go move to our second speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Aninda Bandupadhyay. Uh, he's currently works as a genome editing lead and head of biotech at CIMIT, and he's currently based in, in Mexico, our headquarter. Uh, 
Anindya completed his PhD from International Rice Research Institute in Philippines and on plant molecular biology. Uh, and later on, he finished his postdoc uh, from University of California, Berkeley and University of Kentucky uh, in the USA. Uh, it, uh, Aninda has a, a long and uh, professional career with a several renowned organization all around the world. He started his career after his postdoc back again at Erie uh, under a C4 uh, Rice Consortium, where he supervised and led I know plant biotech and gene editing uh, work. Later on, he worked for uh, Syngenta in, in where he laid multi-country, uh, multi-crop you know, genome editing program. Uh, before joining CIMIT, Anindya worked as a vice president for synthetic biology for Reliance Industries Limited uh, at India. So Anindya is going to talk about a shelf plus project, which is a genome editing project currently CIMIT is running and, and give uh, his, his thoughts around you know, how we can improve the shelf life of, of permalid. Aninda, over to you. So can you see my presentation? Yep, we can see your presentation. Yep, you are good to go. Okay, just a second. Uh, there is something came in my... Uh, just a second. No, no problem. It's okay, right? Yep, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, uh, Harish, for intro introduction and uh, Dr. Rao for a very nice uh, uh, prelude of the whole thing and uh, gave an overview of the uh, millet, uh, its importance and some challenges. Uh, what it, so I am not repeating those things. Uh, <clears throat> pearl millet, as we know, uh, that a nutrient dense and gluten free cereal, so we consider it as a super food. And uh, due to rancidity, pearl millet remains underutilized. So after milling for five to seven days, you can use it, but after that, you cannot use it anymore because of the rancid character and a foul smell. Now, uh, India is the largest millet producer in the world, followed by Niger, Mali, Nigeria, Sudan, and Ethiopia. But rancidity makes it an uh, underutilized crop for all of these countries. So if we can change uh, the shelf stable uh, from rancid flour to shelf stable flour, then uh, reduced drudgery for women, supply chains will be nice, nu nutritional benefits will be uh, provided, and income opportunities for smallholder farmers can be provided. So what is rancidity? I will just uh, talk briefly. Uh, there are two types of rancidity happens. One is hydrolytic and one is oxidative. So during milling, the bran and germ layer ruptures and releases endogenous enzymes. So that enzyme uh, comments the hydrolysis of stored lipid and, uh, make, and gives rise free fatty acid. And also in the oxidative rancidity, uh, so polyunsaturated fatty acid is developed and which leads to aldehyde oxylipid products and oxylipins. Similarly, free fatty acid gets converted to aldehyde oxylipin products. So these products, the red ones, aldehyde oxylipin lipid products, these has foul smell. So how to get rid of it? So there is another one uh, uh, thing uh, I want to mention uh, that uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid is formed uh, in uh, pearl millet uh, by introduct by uh, one of the enzymes or one of the genes. So two major enzymes we have targeted for hydrolytic rancidity, that orange one here, which converts triglyceride to free fatty acid. And uh, we have also targeted this uh, purple one where oleic acid gets converted to linoleic acid. So if we can stop, we can reduce the polyunsaturated fatty acid production inside of the uh, pearl millet flour. So uh, two things, create inactive mutant alleles of candidate gene, which have been functionally validated in the yeast system to lower lipid degradation activity during flour storage. So this is already in yeast, people have checked that if you change this gene, so B here, try triglycerol to carbonyls, and then rancidity off order uh, and shelf life becomes reduced. 
So we will use CRISPR-Cas9 system to change this triglycerol uh, to a hydro, uh, hydrolysis. And also we will use another one knockout by CRISPR-Cas9 so that fatty acid to oxidoreductase formation doesn't happen. So polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, becomes less and monounsaturated fatty acid becomes a more in the palmillate flower. The two genes we have found uh, after a lot of search in uh, bioinformatically and uh, previous work, uh, from previous work on yeast. So uh, two genes, and now we see uh, these two genes we can target by genome editing. So we have designed everything for doing genome editing, and then we will do transformation, editing will happen, then we'll assess the potential benefit of this genome editing technology for converting rancid, rancidity to non-rancidity. So here I'm not going in detail. So these are the genes we amplified, gene one, two variants of gene one we amplified, gene two we amplified, there are two variants. So how we did that and what are the uh, primers used, what kind of uh, cloning we have used, I am not going in those detail. Uh, and then uh, sequence confirmation was done. And we found there are a uh, few exons and few introns as we expect in any gene. And we targeted early exons, exon one and exon two of each of these genes so that we can cut there by CRISPR-Cas9, make a double strand break, mutation happens. And then due to mutation, these two genes doesn't work. And if these two genes are stopped from working, then our flower, uh, palmillate flower will not be rancid. Now, specific gRNA, while designing, we could find there are certain uh, U6 promoter, ZMA's U6 promoter was used, which is very good in driving the gRNA so that it can go and carry Cas9 with it. And Cas9 can cut the uh, uh, gene and stop it from working. Now we have used, uh, one thing we are doing at CIMIT, we are not taking any model uh, plant or we are not taking any easily transformable uh, lines, rather we are taking our elite lines. So here I have mentioned some of the elite lines which we are trying. So directly editing in elite, elite line will reduce the breeding downstream breeding time. So we checked many and out of these seven elite lines, we could transform four of them uh, very easily and we are standardizing that further. So uh, we are using immature embryo, then uh, through callus pathway, we are taking it to uh, 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 downstream further development. And then uh, you can see a gradual uh, 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 movement towards regeneration. And we could develop a protocol, which is only takes only 63 days. And we can develop a edited line through genome editing and tissue culture within around two months. So this is a, a CIMIT, uh, it is developed in CIMIT, uh, Mexico. And what is the timeline? So we have thought we will finish this by end of 2024, the last one. Uh, Peter and others, they will talk about uh, their uh, involvement. This number four is mostly engaging value chain stakeholders for finding the, uh, doing the value chain analysis, then identifying consumer demand and design of gender international interventions for palmated pollution development. Initially, we will do it in Kenya and Burkina Faso, and then gradually we will take it to other countries. And one to three, if you see, so gene edited lines we are developing. Uh, we are here, 2023 end, and uh, at least one to two nurse partners uh, from Nigeria and Kenya short-term training we have given, and we have plan of giving uh, more training, how genome editing could be used for uh, taking out the uh, uh, rancidity characteristics of uh, palmillet. So this is our timeline. And by 2024 end, we expect we can tell scientific, scientific community and general public that uh, we are hopeful that we have done genome editing and we have got rid of two important two genes, which were 
basically giving this rancidity characteristics uh, in pearl millet flower. So absence of these two genes, pearl millet will not be rancid and we'll be able to use uh, for longer time and downstream product development will be easier. So, and you have, okay, you're yeah, done, all right. So, yeah, I'm done. Uh, thank you. And this work has been funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I thank CIMIT CGIR for all kind of support. Thank you very much for attending the seminar. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Anindya. So I think it's very interesting to see the, the progress what Dr. Dakar has shown on the processing side and, and also seeing this very upstream science on modifying the genes. Now, what we're going to understand is the value of this trait uh, from uh, you know, our, our value chain partners. So let me introduce uh, two speakers uh, who are going to talk about the work they are doing in various countries in Africa, uh, Dr. Peter Rustard and Dr. Pauline Muendi. So Dr. Peter Rustard, he's a seed system specialist uh, with the International Maize and Wheat Center, CIMIT. He's currently based in Nairobi. Uh, his work uh, focuses on seed systems and market intelligence for cereal crops in East Africa. You know, before joining CIMIT, he worked at, uh, like Aninda, at International Rice Research Institute in Philippines. And he also worked as a research director for Hestec International, uh, which is a, a market research consultancy firm in, in Belgium. Uh, so that's a Peter. And my second speaker and the last speaker for today is Paul Muendi. He's a research support specialist with CIMIT, uh, again, based in Kenya, uh, Nairobi. Her work supports the design and implementation of research studies on serial seed systems with a focus on understanding seed accessibility, choices, and preferences of seed in East Africa using quantitative and qualitative methods, right? So please welcome uh, both of them uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you hear me correctly. I'll share now my screen and put it into full, uh, full slide modus. I hope this is all okay, Harish. Can you quickly confirm? Yep, it is fine. It looks oh, fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and thanks, thanks for having me here. And it's also a great pleasure to speak after Dr. Anindya, with whom I indeed watched in Philippines, the World Cup of 2014 together, because we were both working there at the same time, on fully different projects. Um, but um, it's great to see him, him again and work again with him. So, and we are also part of, as, as Dr. Aninia described, of the Shelf Plus project. Uh, and I would love to do this presentation each time after him, so I don't have to actually explain all the details about reduced transitivity. But what we will talk about in this presentation is what the potential impact of this technology can be on the ground um, in, in uh, Kenya and Burkina Faso. So as already introduced, we have the Shelf Plus project. What the key questions we are asking uh, with our team is, what are the potential impacts of investments in gene editing for millet transitivity on the ground now, but also into the future? What can be, what can be achieved? What are the product requirements for millet besides non transitivity What are the other aspects that we should pay attention to in both of those countries and what steps are also needed to ensure then farmer uptake of these new varieties. So once all the good work is done around gene editing, how do these products get into farmer hands? And that's where market intelligence helps to step in. We can, by understanding the local context, try to guide both product design and seed system strategy. So we did this for this project, both in Kenya and Burkina Faso, and maybe to highlight also why those two, country, two countries are um, targeted because uh, those countries also have quite um, positive gene editing regulations and they are they are quite positive about um, gene edited products. Now, our work we did, uh, what we did is mostly qualitative research. We, we did a lot of key informant interviews, we did focus group discussions, but also observations. We went to see shops, we went to see agro dealers uh, where seed is being sold. And what we did is we made an assessment of different actors along the seed as well as the grain value chain. We look at seed multipliers and agro dealers where seeds uh, can be sold, but we talked, we talked with farmers, but we also looked at consumers, flower producers, and millers to get their feedback as well as engagements with the Mars. Now, 
bit of background on both of the countries where we are working. So Pearl Millet in Kenya and Burkina Faso. So in both countries, Kenya as well as Burkina Faso, the production of Pearl Millet is in the dry zone. It's one of the most successful cereals you can produce in dry zones. Now, it does mean that it's a bit of a different target area. For Kenya, it means that this more eastern, northern area of Kenya in Burkina Faso, well, it's the whole country producing it. So while the area in Kenya is around 125,000 hectares, it's over a million hectares in Burkina Faso. So what we see uh, for uh, Pearl Millet, it's one of the main staples in that specific region for Kenya. So if you look at the value chain or how the flour is produced, and, and where it's consumed, it's limited to the production zone. Now, and the main use is, is uji, uji, it's a porridge. Uh, in Burkina Faso, however, it's really the, the production and consumption is throughout the whole country. It's one of the main staples. The main use is to, uh, I hope I produce this correctly, uh, but we also, they also produce couscous and porridge. Now I'll hand it over to uh, Pauline. Pauline did the field work, so was out in Kenya in the areas, talking to farmers and a lot of other uh, stakeholders. And she worked together with uh, Sylvanus, who was leading uh, Burkina Faso work. So I'll hand it over to her for uh, to continue the presentation. Uh, thank you, Peter. So in Kenya, the main challenges that are hindering palm millet production is, is the current seed system, bad damage, as well as post-harvest management. The seed system has not released millet seed products in over two decades. Kenya has only released three varieties between 2000 and 2001. We also did an observation method where we went to look at the various agro dealers if they are stocking any kind of seed that farmers could be able to purchase and there were no available palm millet seeds in the market. Farmers usually access local varieties mainly through recycled or saved seed. They also do a lot of seed exchange amongst themselves and they will purchase grain to use as seed. Another key challenge was the bad damage. As we know, uh, palm millet is very prone to bad damage. Bad damage was ranked as the biggest challenge that farmers are facing in terms of uh, pro millet production. Not only are farmers losing a lot of their yields to birds, they're also spending a lot of their resources, including time and their money just to chase away birds. One of the local varieties that we came across was called Mwanza. It is grown in Kitui County, has an important attribute that makes it less prone to bird attack. Spiklets on its ear head make it very pricky and sharp for their bird's eyes, so they are not able to access or consume the, the seed. You can see from the pictures, these two women are holding uh, configured ropes, which are usually used to throw stones uh, to chase away the birds. Post-harvest management is also very labor intensive and time consuming. This is mainly because the farmers lack the mechanized threshers and they also lack tarpaulins. So because they have no uh, mechanized threshers, they have to use a big wooden stick just to heat or separate the grain from the, the crop or the stock. So for older women, this is quite a challenge because it's very physically exhausting. So they would have to hire uh, workers to support this activity. As we know, winnowing process can cause a lot of respiratory issues when you're trying to separate the grain from the chaff and the dust as well. In Burkina Faso, uh, the palm millet seed system is a combination of traditionally saved seed safe tech practices, as well as formal efforts by the res nat national research institutions such as INERA and other stakeholders such as seed companies trying to improve and release uh, uh, varieties to farmers. There have been many varieties that have been released in uh, Burkina Faso, but in 2021, they released their first hybrid palm millet variety. Palm millet var seed system has various acts actors, including the INERA, which is the National Agricultural Program, which have, works hand in hand and partners and collaborates with the, the private sector. This includes uh, seed companies such as La Faso, Pagri, pharma groups, as well as seed multiplication to be able to develop the, the palm millet uh, breeding pipeline, as well as release uh, more varieties into the market. The main criteria of seed selection is usually based on high productivity, drought resistance, <laughs> because these areas are usually quite uh, uh, drought uh, high. And then also the issue of early maturity and the resistance to post-harvest pests. Other challenges that were highlighted by different stakeholders, including the seed multipliers, in includes the inefficiency of the seed system. As we know, the certification process in Burkina Faso is quite expensive. So this really hinders the, the ability to be able to release certified seeds. 
The lack of access to basic seeds is also a huge issue. And then lack of access to credit facilities that would be needed by the seed multipliers. According to farmers, the recurrent drought stresses, striker infestation, which always has a big impact on the amount of yields, uh, causes a lot of yield losses, bad and also post harvest usually is a big challenge. For the processors, the lack of adequate grain supply in the market is a big challenge. Currently, as we know, there's a lot of insecurity happening, hap happening in Burkina Faso. So because a lot of the production of millet is happening in the rural areas, the transportation to the to the capital city of Burkina Faso is a big challenge because uh, most, most of the processors are based in, uh, in the capital center. Again, lack of modern equipment for processing. They don't have the equipment to, to make a really fine uh, palm millet flour. How does rancidity affect different value chain actors? In Kenya, rancidity was not a major constraint because they're dealing with other challenges, but it does inconvenience them because there's a lot of frequent visit to local mills and the amount of flour they can, they can mill is quite, quite low or small. There's also longer waiting time at, at the local mill. Sometimes uh, a miller will require the customers to wait for other customers to bring in their grain so that he, can, he or she can be able to mill everything at once. Because this is an important uh, food crop, there's a lot of frequent hand or mechanical milling done by women just to prepare porridge for the, the, the young children to go to school. For the millers, the cost of regular starting up of the mills is quite uh, tedious. And also just to mill small quantities, is, it's quite a strain for them. And then for the, there's a lot of wastage of flour that goes rancid, so they'd have to discard, discard of it. So for the consumers, again, this is also a lot of wastage that happens when the, the flour goes or the food goes rancid, they have to throw it out. For the processors, we did a scan with big supermarkets in Kenya. We also did a, a scan in the local shop on the stores in the in the various uh, in the various study locations that we went to and found that there was no packed uh, palm millet flour for sale. In Burkina Faso, although many of the stakeholders did uh, consider uh, did recognize that flour does go rancid, it was not seen as a major barrier to production or use. Just like in Kenya, farmers have to do a lot of frequent by willing. Yes? Yeah, you have one minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the rancidity uh, for the consumers, rancid food also goes, uh, is also used as feed for animals. For the processors, a lot of, uh, they've adjusted to palmillet uh, rancidity by using the vacuum sealing technologies, which is used to extend the shelf life of palmillet flour. Thank you. So just to close, uh, what we also think about is looking forward into the future. So what is needed to make the, the, those rancidity products a success? Because as we see it right now, for example, in Kenya, scenario one would be that you do genetic improvement, but there's no seed system present. So you wouldn't get any returns on gene editing or breeding investments. Scenario two would be if we would have a functional seed system together with genetic improvement, not only on rancidity, but also on yield and other effects, we would see mainly impact on farmers and local consumers by yield increase in production, reduced drudgery and increased consumption. But if we would combine this with also commercial demand, for example, through blending as was shown by Sarah, uh, in a presentation in the last session, you could also have potential benefits for urban consumers with increased nutrition and processors that would have increased product diversity. So these different scenarios are potentially possible in the future. Now, just to conclude, I think what we want to highlight is that different countries might need different steps to be successful in this type of product. But what, what really stood out was the need for also post-harvest machinery in a crop like Pearl Millet. The development of target product profiles should include traits needed uh, by farmers and other stakeholders to be useful for the local situation. And it's I think we also want to highlight that integrating market intelligence in early stages of product development can both support product design as well as seed system strategies to make sure these products be, uh, go into the hands of farmers. And thank you very much for your interest. This was indeed uh, supported by William and Gates Foundation and also by the Market Intelligence Initiative. Thank you very much. And I will now stop sharing. All right. May I request all of my speakers to turn on their videos and be online? And because we have a series of questions, I will just quickly ask, first of all, thank you, uh, Peter and Pauline, uh, for a wonderful presentation on understanding the constraint faced by a farmer in Kenya and Burkina Faso. 
Uh, with that, I would like to thank each of the speaker, Dr. Dayakara, Dr. Ninda, and again, Peter and, and, and Pauline. So my first question um, is to Dr. Dayakara. There's a question around, uh, from your slide, it sounded like there are a lot of products which can be used in a solid, you know, you have turned millet into very several solid products. Do you, is there any experience at NutriHub to turn millet, millet products into beverages? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. <clears throat> and I'm very glad to present uh, that uh, there are, there is a, really just a concerted efforts that are being made to bring in some of the beverages, especially in terms of uh, uh, plant-based millet milk. Uh, in fact, the technology is also transferred to one of the startups. So you can see uh, the package uh, Tetra Pak where the millet milk is being sold and recently in World Food Program also, World Food India, uh, Prime Minister has promoted it. So the, I think there is a good news. Uh, second thing in terms of soup mix, just like nor mixes and all those things, nor soup, you know that. Uh, similarly, we brought out some of the soups uh, which are marketable quality and uh, many entrepreneurs, uh, they have taken this technology licensing. In addition to that, uh, there are something like sherbets in Indian beverage, which uh, were millet-based sherbet uh, things were especially used during the summer season. I think the, those beverages and also some of the things are Danone, you know, that main dairy company where the Lassi is another beverage which is being used extensively in India. Uh, so we have a pearl millet and uh, uh, sorghum both uh, being the part of it, uh, especially the malt that is being used uh, in combination with this. So all these uh, testify that there is a concerted efforts that are being made to bring in not just solid foods because of time constraint, perhaps I have skipped those things, but uh, we are very much on to that and we are willing okay. to transfer these technologies. Okay, thank you. So let me ask you a quickly a follow-up question. You just mentioned towards the end that you can transfer these technologies. Has, do you have any experience of licenses, licensing this technology out of India? And if so, you know what would be a general process? So the general process, I think within the country, there should not be any problem or they will come with an expression of interest and then just uh, they will have to sign an MOU if they are agreeing because there are tariff. Uh, so we have come out with little innovative thing. Now, if you want one technology, perhaps it would be costing a little about 50,000 or so, but within the India. Then if you want anything from three to five, we bunch them and say that uh, it could cost you 33. And anything above five, then we call it is twenty five thousand per. Day. So we our main aim was uh, to begin with uh, how to popularize this technology. So in that context, I think we have come out that and it worked out well because any entrepreneur or startup company, they take up the technology licensing not just with one product in mind, but a shelf, you know, a shelf full of uh, millet products. I think this is working in a very favorable way, and we sign an MOU with a concerned startup company or an entrepreneur and provide the technology. This particular cost includes uh, uh, training uh, so that they may come and uh, we will provide the dockets, uh, technology docket, and then we will also handhold them with uh, uh, nutritional profiling, sensory profiling, and shelf life analysis of this thing. So this is all part of that, uh, each of the products uh, that we will provide part of the technology licensing. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Dagara. Uh, maybe let me ask a question to Dr. Anindya. So they are saying very nice presentation. And can we use the genomedine technology for Striga, which is we saw in the presentation from Peter and Pauline, the Striga is a major constraint. Uh, do you know of any plans of using genome editing for Striga? One of the audience also suggested a gene actually, <laughs> which you can consider and use. Uh, over to you, uh, Thank you. Thank you for the questions. The thing is, uh, we are already working on Striga. So we have we are uh, collaborating with one of the leaders in Striga biology from University of Amsterdam. And then uh, what we are doing, we have identified uh, five genes for uh, Striga, and we are trying to uh, remove them uh, by genome editing CRISPR-Cas9 technology from uh, maize and sorghum. We all, once we see, we see what happens in the maize, we also have plan of extending it to for the millets. So thank you. Um, maybe a question to Peter and, and Pauline. Uh, you know, we notice 
the rancidity was was really managed by using a processing in such a way by the farmer in Burkina. Uh, but if we, did you had a chance to meet any processors in in the, I think you mentioned you did meet with processors. So was it being mentioned as a something they have been concerned about something? Uh, I mean, are they using some treatments which Dr. Rao talked about to manage uh, rancidity? Peter, should I take this? Yeah, for the processors that we talk to, uh, nearly all of them do not uh, process palm millet now because of again because of the issue of supply and then the issue of rancidity. It's only we came across one trader who is supplying palm millet flour in the market. Only he is able to use the vacuum sealing technology. That's about it. But in Burkina, uh, Pauline. In Burkina, in Burkina Faso, yes. In Burkina Faso, they're using a lot of the vacuum sealing technology, but they're only able to, to packet at least 500 grams to one kg uh, packet of palm oil flour because once you open it up, after a few days, it does go rancid again. Okay, so there is a challenge. I think they are managing tactically, you know, by reducing the packet size and vacuum packing it. So that way, the, once the consumer opens it, they can consume it within seven days or 10 days, the product. Sure. So that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if this is uh, a question. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's a question for Dr. Rao or on India. So it says how to control increased alcoholic acidity contained in pre packaged whole per millet floors. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, there are a lot of questions which are not relevant to the topic we had today, but I thought this could be related to the the rancidity. So I'm not sure, Dr. Rao or Aninda, if you, if you want to take a shot at it. Uh, I will repeat the question. It says, how to control increased alcoholic acidity content in prepackaged whole per millet floors? There so, are some uh, pre-processing techniques. Sir. Uh, that could uh, really just tackle to some extent, uh, but not fully, especially with uh, regard to the alcohol acidity content uh, uh, in the prepackaged whole millet flours. So there are in Indian some 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 of the startups are so one big thing that they are getting into that particular um, pearl millet uh, shelf life, which they put it around two months to three months, which I see an integrated shelf life management practices which they adopt. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the practices about the pre-processing technologies that they use uh, by soaking, uh, then again drying, and then coming out with that. And the second one is about parboiling the things and then making it a flour. So you find, especially in suji, what you call a semolina, there also you find this technique, uh, not complete parboiling, a partial part parboiling, and then coming out with the recent studies also we found that uh, that is really just giving it. Now, one of the thing is that little uh, order that comes out of it, how we have to tackle and that uh, there is a way out also. Uh, that's what uh, in my conclusion, I was telling that uh, there is you know, it's like a perfect storm where we have problems, but we have also solutions to this. The only thing is the market demand, if it is, as I saw that in both the countries, Burkina Faso and even Kenya. So I think... Uh, the market demand, if it is that, then the more industry coming, these problems could not be, may not be a major problem because if you can, with the low hanging fruits available, I'm sure that we'll be able to market the products. If not in the pearl millet floor form, it could be in the form of a, a semolina, it could be in the form of a extruded products. So we need to know that how we can extend the shelf life through a processing technology and sell those products and make them more consumer friendly. Right. Thank you, Dr. Dakar Rao. I think we are left with only one minute. Um, and I think there was also a last question, which you already answered about, you know, the, it seems that the floor of this grain is, 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 uh, is exported out of India to many different countries. Still, it doesn't have the rancid or bitter taste. And I think you already mentioned that just now that there are different ways. Uh, it's kind of an integrated shelf life management uh, of of the, the the whole processing, so it looks like in terms of rancidity, what we have understanding is the processors are finding different ways to manage it as of now, till there are any genetic solutions uh, which would come through. I think people are maybe developing small package, they're doing vacuum sealing, maybe pre-processing, paraboiling, 
So there are various technologies available to manage it for, for now. So, so on India and team, we are waiting on you to develop that uh, genome edited <laughs> product and the you know, genesis to further, you know, maybe it becomes part of integrated shelf life management uh, aspect as well as Dr. Dayakar Rao uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. So with that, I would like to like to finish on time here. So I'd like to thank all of the speakers, uh, starting with Dr. Dayakar Rao, uh, Dr. Anindya, Dr. Peter, and, and Pauline Wendy. So thank you again for joining. As I mentioned, this is a series of webinars we do. So we will do one more maybe at the end of January, early February now, after the holiday seasons are over. There will be at least one or two more webinars on the millet, and then we'll go to uh, different rally and crops. So please do join us. And, and we sincerely appreciate uh, your time and energy and all the great questions. Thanks again. And uh, uh, good night or, or good afternoon or good morning, depending on you know uh, where you are. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> thank you all for coming to the presentation. And all my co-speakers. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>